since the Pokemon series first debuted in the UK over two decades ago. I have always had a real fascination with the series. From memorising stats in the Generation 1 games as a way to make friends, to using Pokemon Go to recover from surgery, and currently trying to hunt down rare shiny variants of every single creature in the series, I am really quite deep down the rabbit hole of Pokemon game fandom. However, until recently, there is a method of playing through Pokemon games that I had never actually tried, or at the very least not stuck with long enough to fully appreciate the challenge of. While I'd previously played a few hours of runs here and there, only recently did I attempt my first fully committed Nuzlocke run of a Pokemon game. So, for the uninitiated, what is a Nuzlocke run of a Pokemon game? Well, in short, it's a fan-made set of custom rules players impose on themselves to make Pokemon games much harder to complete. The rules vary by which Pokemon game you're playing, and some of the rules are considered optional add-ons depending on how difficult you want the challenge to be, but there are some basics most players agree on. In a Pokemon Nuzlocke run, players can only catch one Pokemon in each new route of the game, and wherever possible, that Pokemon should be the first Pokemon randomly encountered on that route. In the older Pokemon games with random battles spawning from patches of grass, players are only allowed to catch the first Pokemon that leaps out at them. In newer games like Sword and Shield, where Pokemon sometimes appear on the overworld, players might catch the first Pokemon they see spawn, or randomise their encounter with methods like closing their eyes and running around in circles. Players have to nickname their Pokemon so that they get attached to them, which tends to happen because of how few you have available to you. Lastly, if a Pokemon faints in battle, it's considered dead, and you can no longer use it in future fights. If you're in a battle, and all six Pokemon in your team are knocked out, you lose the run, even if you had additional Pokemon left alive still in your PC. The idea behind a Nuzlocke run is simple. To get players attached to, and reliant, on Pokemon they might not have otherwise selected to use in their team normally. When you're going up against a Grass-type gym with no Fire-type Pokemon, because your three encounters you had on the way there were all water types, you don't have much of a choice as a player but to make the best of a bad situation, and try to fight against the odds to win. It's notably more challenging than a regular playthrough, and often leads to memorable stories for the player. With the basics explained, I recently attempted a Nuzlocke run in Pokemon Shield, with several additional rules in place to make my experience more difficult. I only caught one Pokemon in each route, nicknamed my Pokemon and considered them dead if knocked out, but I also switched my game to set mode, where players don't get a free Pokemon switch when they knock out an enemy creature, and forbid myself from using healing items during battle. If a Pokemon didn't have a move to heal itself, any damage it took during a fight would be permanent until the fight ended. I avoided using the game's friendship building mechanics, which can sometimes cause your Pokemon to survive a hit which should rightly have killed them, and I resisted the urge to overlevel my team, trying to never have my team of Pokemon more than three, maybe four levels stronger than the trainer I was about to fight, right through until the end of the game. While I realised that many of these self-imposed rules decreased my odds of making it to the end of the game successfully, that was kind of the point. I've played through Pokemon games in the past, confident in my ability to see the end credits roll, but I wanted to experience something new. If I knew my Pokemon could survive any enemy, due to luck-based free survival, or being super leveled, I knew I could probably complete the playthrough without any losses. That's not the point of a Nuzlocke. At least to me. For me, a Nuzlocke is about close calls, victory through strategy, relying on a sub-ideal team, and seeing how far you can go under impossible odds. If I wasn't going to have to mourn the losses of some valued Pokemon along the way, I wasn't interested. So, how did my first Nuzlocke playthrough go? Well, here's the story, summarised for your pleasure. Well, at least as summarised as I can make a 30 hour story anyway. I started the game by allowing the Twitch chat to pick which of Generation 8's starter Pokemon I would take with me on my journey. The chat chose the water type frog Pokemon Sobble, who is adorable but set me up for a really tough time against the first gym in the game. 
My first real challenge would be the grass type gym leader Milo, so I knew I would need to find something with type advantage against grass type creatures along my way. We named Sobble Frogger, and a lot of the, our hopes for the late game were placed on my sad water baby's shoulders. On Route 1, we closed our eyes and ran into a Wooloo. While Wooloo is decently defensive and can throw out some decent normal type attacks in the early game, their lack of elemental moves meant that they didn't stick around our team for too long. They were useful in the early game when we needed to pad out the party, but less so once we had to rely on type advantages to stay alive. We named Wooloo Sean and left to grab our Pokedex. Then, on Route 2, early tragedy struck. We encountered a Nicket, a pure dark type who would have been incredibly helpful in the late game. Remember this moment people, because when I start to have difficulty in the late game dealing with ghost type Pokemon, my lack of a pure dark type is entirely my own doing. While mindlessly mashing buttons, I accidentally attacked Nicket one too many times, knocking it out, and making it so that my only chance at collecting a creature on Route 2 was gone. It was already in the yellow health, we probably could have caught it, but my own lack of focus was its demise. I screwed up, and it was a wake up call. If I was going to complete this challenge I needed to take my time, think things through, and not press confirm on any action without being certain it was a smart move to make. With Nicket out of the picture, I felt vulnerable. I survived the fight with my rival and got my Dynamax banned, but it was a far tighter fight than I had hoped. I needed a new Pokemon, and I needed one ASAP. I realised I would need to think creatively going forwards, and see if there were any locations, not strictly numbered routes, where I could encounter more Pokemon. After leaving the game's starting town, I had to make a couple more choices about which Pokemon I would and would not be allowed to have on my team. We decided early on that gift Pokemon, creatures given to you without the risk of having to fight them or throw balls to capture them, were off the table. The gift Pikachu and Eevee, as well as the later gift Toxel, were all too powerful to receive for free, and didn't follow the spirit of our team being randomised along the way. Additionally, to ensure we could get a variety of what the wild area had to offer, we decided that after our initial visit to the wild area, we would be allowed to return after each completed gym, to pick a new section of the wild area and catch a new random Pokemon from that zone. That would give us 8 additional Pokemon encounters before the end of the game, with a variety of potential types and levels, which could give us a better shot at having the type coverage we would need to survive. On my first visit to the wild area, I picked up a Bunnelby, who we called Babs. As a ground type, I fully expected her to become a core part of my team later in the game, but she was ultimately sidelined for a subsequent beefier ground type with more type coverage in their moves. We also went back to our starting town, where an event to promote in-game DLC gave us the chance to encounter a Galarian Slowpoke inside a train station. We debated whether or not this constituted a gift Pokemon or a new area, but because it was strongly levelled, required a fight, and required being caught with Pokeballs, as well as appearing inside the town, we felt this constituted a valid capture within the city limits, not on a previously caught route. We nicknamed them Hubert, and continued our journey to Motorstoke to register for the Pokemon League Challenge. While wandering around Motorstoke itself, we managed to find a fishing spot within the city limits for another encounter, and came across Tootle, a little snapping turtle who evolves into the fairly formidable water and rock type Dreadnought. We managed to capture this beast, who became a core part of our team going forward, and named them Captain Crunch. We registered for the Pokemon League successfully, survived our first fight with friendly goth rival Marnie, and left for Route 3. There, we caught a Stunky, the butt-faced skunk poison-type Pokemon who we lovingly named Peaches. Peaches offered us a much-needed additional element type on our team, and looking forward to the upcoming gyms seemed like a viable solution for our eventual fight with the Fairy-type gym, as well as a solution for the upcoming Grass gym. Frogger also evolved into a Drizzile, their awkward teenage phase, offering us a second stage evolution who might be able to tank some hits if we were in a bad spot. Inside Galar Mine we caught a Rog and Roller, a small, heavy, adorable rock type, who again offered us a sturdy creature with a needed elemental type to hopefully keep our adventure moving. We named them, unimaginatively perhaps, Rocky. 
We had a rough time in our first fight with asshole rival Bede, but we scraped through, leaving the cave and approaching our first gym still relatively unscathed. In the fields after that cave, I had one final chance to catch a new Pokemon before we had to start fighting gym leaders, and happened to run into a Pumpkaboo, a dual-type grass ghost Pokemon shaped like an adorable scary floating pumpkin. We named the Ghost Gourd Gordon, and left to tackle the grass type gym, our first real challenge. Heading into the grass gym, I basically led all my matches using Peaches the Stunky. She was equipped with the poison type move Acid Spray, which lowered special defense while doing super effective damage, which I hoped would be enough to get us through the gym unscathed. While we handled the traders leading to the gym leader without too much trouble, I was caught off guard when leader Milo's Pokemon all had several levels lead on Stunky, allowing them to tank her hits. When you're still dealing with Pokemon in the late teen levels, a 2-3 to three level difference really makes a noticeable impact. Additionally, I failed to pay proper attention to how many Pokemon Milo had in his party, leading to him Dynamaxing his Elder Goss before I was ready and prepared to Dynamax my own creature in response. This basically led to Peaches having to tank a hit from a creature the size of a Skyscraper, very nearly killing them right there and then. She just about survived the punch, so I Dynamaxed her. That was a bad move. I knew that Dynamaxing increased the health of a Pokemon, but I vastly overestimated how much HP she would get in the process. She got off one big poison attack, but was swiftly knocked out. We scraped through the final Pokemon with the help of Gordon and Hubert, as well as Frogger, who again nearly died from a single attack, but we did scrape through the gym with only one Pokemon lost. Considering how little we had in terms of Pokemon with proper type advantage, and the fact we were underleveled for the leader's Pokemon, losing Peaches certainly hurt, but in hindsight we did remarkably well surviving as well as we did. With a team of largely rock and water types, most of the creatures we had would have been steamrolled if expected to hold their own. With Gym 1 defeated, we returned to the wild area and caught a Snova, who we called Grover. While not usually a Pokemon I would have paid much attention to, adding an Ice type to our team was going to be vital for several upcoming gyms, so I was ecstatic. On our way to the next route, for our next catch, we came up against a trainer with a Clink, that steel type Pokemon that looks like a pair of gears with faces. What I hadn't realised until this moment was that I had absolutely zero Pokemon in my team able to effectively deal with Steel types, and suffered as a result. We lost Rocky, and in the process realised that we really needed to level up our team to match the level curve of enemy trainers if we were going to have a hope of overcoming our current type deficits on the team. At the campsite, just beyond the first gym, we picked up a Lombre, a combination grass and water type Pokemon. While I was initially sceptical how much help they would be in the party, their secret weapons were the fact that they knew how to use Giga Drain, a strong grass type move that comes with a strong free health restoration, as well as the fact that when they evolved to a Ludicolo, their HP and defense get really tanky. With a water type gym on the immediate horizon, we nicknamed them Lombro, and went on a risky quest to evolve them as soon as possible. Deep in the north of the wild area, a location that at this part of my adventure was massively overleveled for my team's strength, and could likely one-hit kill many of my party, lay a grass stone hidden along a secret path. I ran through the area, using all my skill and luck to avoid any encounters, grabbed the stone, evolved Lombro, and got the hell out of there as fast as I could. In Hullbury, the town where the second gym is found, we picked up an Arrowcuda by fishing inside the town limits. We named them Aaron Kuda, with a little heart emoji at the end, the heart standing for the, the band Heart, who had a song called Barracuda. It made sense in the moment, trust me. Uh, we placed them in the box in case late game we might need a backup water type to add to our team. I was never going to complain about having more water types, even if I already had a lot of them. Additionally, Captain Crunch evolved into a Dreadnought, which was a big relief and massively improved their viability on the team. Dessa's water type gym was honestly a walk in the park. Lomro walked through every trainer and the gym leader with ease, and we barely had to worry once that any of our creatures were in any real danger. In the second Galar mine, I picked up a Binacle, another water and rock type Pokemon that we called Chucklevision. 
The creature knew a bug move, but it largely stood to be a replacement in our team if Captain Crunch took fatal damage along our journey. Back in the wild area, we encountered a matchop, whose fighting typing was later going to be incredibly important for our adventure. We named him DeVito, because he was small and full of powerful rage. Back in the mine, a poorly timed dark move from Teton Yell managed to kill Hubert in one hit, leaving us with our third fatality of the run, only two and a bit gyms into our quest. Before we had even had time to properly take in what had happened, we also lost Grover, leaving our team without an ice type too. We left the mine and found a coffin, who we caught and popped in the party as a replacement for Stunky. We were going to need a poison type or a steel type to handle the fairy type gym, and all our hopes were on this poison sphere revolving a top hat and sweeping that gym when the time arrived. Hence, Smogboy joined the party. Returning to Motorstoke, while we had just suffered some unfortunate losses, I felt there was very little I needed to worry about when facing the fire type gym leader. The fire type gym has a unique format, where trainers fight and catch Pokemon inside the gym itself, which the Twitch chat watching the stream decided constituted a new area to catch one Pokemon, as decided at random. Of the three fire type creatures in the gym, I was randomly assigned Vulpix, a pure fire type, who finally gave us a decent option for dealing with future steel or ice type encounters we might have to face. We named Vulpix Nikitu, in memory of our fallen Nikit from Route 2, and pledged that they would make the journey with us to the championships in Winden in Nikit's place. If Nikit couldn't see the finals herself, her new surrogate I had promised would do so in her place. Kabu, the fire type gym leader, caused us very little challenge. Frogger swept the gym pretty much single-handed, leading us to victory. We used a Firestone to evolve Nikitu into Ninetales, and then left for the wild area to catch a new creature. We crossed the bridge into the, the very beginnings of the Northern Wild area, encountering a Vanillite to pop on our team. While it was the lowest evolutionary stage of Ice Cream Cone and not particularly strong, we were going to need it levelled up as our replacement Ice type if we were going to have any hope later fighting the Dragon type gym. Of course, we named him Mr. Whippy. After making it safely through the wild area, making it to the Dragon type gym town, getting through some plot and progressing our way towards Snow on side, we ended up having an unavoidable and tragic loss that really hurt our overall team structure. In an unavoidable battle with a trainer whose team consisted of a Clefairy and Clefable, both exclusively spamming Metronome, we were placed in the unenviable position of having absolutely zero clue what elemental type of attack could be thrown at us from one turn to the next. With completely random attacks being thrown around, I swapped into Smog Boy, only to be hit with an out of the blue power gem, wiping our only poison type out instantly. Once again we had an important element type missing from our team, with the fairy gem drawing ever closer. Later on that same route, we did however pick up one of our team's mainstay additions, a ground-type Hippopotas. This adorable little ground-type Hippo, once evolved, would be another member of our team with very strong biting attacks that later could be learnt into various elements, and lots of health and defence, so we added them to our team ASAP. We nicknamed this adorable Hippo Leah Moira, after my GIF drunk space captain character from a recent Dice Funk D&D campaign I was a part of. Leah Moira evolved basically right away, making me a lot more confident in using her in combat. Before heading to the fourth gym, the ghost type gym I had been fearing for quite some time, I evolved Frogger into an Inteleon, its beefy final stage evolution, and evolved Mr. Whippy into Vanillish. We had a very tough battle with our rival Hop, who, their flying type water type Cramorant really caused us issues. We had no electric type Pokemon on our team, we had a lot of creatures that were weak to water attacks, and our only viable grass type would have been fine with water moves, but was liable to take massive damage from flying type moves. Additionally, Cramorant spitting out its fish when injured dealt a lot more damage than we anticipated, and made this rival fight a much closer affair than I would have liked. Jumping ahead to my fight with Alistair, the ghost type gym leader, we opened the fight with Lombro, whose water and grass type moves made a good counter for your mask and its rock typing. I tried switching into Hippodon and Captain Crunch during the fight, 
hoping they could sweep the rest of the gym with their dart type crunch move, but both fell victim to Curse and Hex, dealing massive damage and leaving them in unsafe territory. I brought out a full strength Frogger, assuming that they could tank a single hit and use their speed and special attack damage to progress the fight, but an unfortunately timed critical hit took out Frogger, our beautiful starter, out of the picture in a single attack. I was devastated. My very first Pokemon was defeated, and suddenly it felt like not one creature on my team was safe. Losing Pokemon I cared about was a real possibility. We eventually risked sending Captain Crunch back in, who Dynamaxed up against Gigantamax Gengar. Captain Crunch managed to crunch its way to victory, and losing Frogger didn't leave us without a water type on our team, but the ghost type gym was a place of grief and loss, an unfortunate forecast of things to come. The ghost type gym leader took my starter from me, and before our story ends he would take more from me. With another gym out of the way and dealt with, we returned to the wild area and managed to luckily pick up a much needed steel type Pokemon, Bronzor. Already on the threshold of evolving, this steel type presented our best hope of defeating the imminently coming up fairy type gym. Beyblade joined the party and very quickly evolved into a giant heavy slow bell, with moves powered up by how slow and heavy it is comparatively. Additionally, in the Fairy Forest, we picked up Hatcherum, who would eventually become a Fairy Psychic dual type to cover some spots in our team. They were named Baby Yaga, and put to one side ready for when they would be needed. Heading into the Fairy Gym, we put Bronzor at the top of our party and just hoped for the best. Honestly, it went more smoothly than I could have hoped for. We switched Pokemon around once or twice, but largely Beyblade carried us through the gym, just smacking fairies much lighter than itself. With the fairy type gym out the way, we picked up Electric, our first electric type Pokemon of the run, and finally a good counter for flying water types like Cramorant. We nicknamed them Static, and continued onward ever closer to the end of our journey, of course evolving them into Minetric as soon as possible. On Route 7 we picked up a Steel-type Perserker that we named Ivan, and on Route 8 we picked up a Haunter, which we traded back and forth to evolve into a Gengar named Handyman. We also trade evolved DeVito into a Machamp, just in time to arrive in Surchester for the Ice-type Gym. The Ice-type Gym also didn't pose too much of a challenge to progression, thanks to Nikitu the Ninetales burning through most of the gym with ease. Static came in useful for any ice types which were also water types, such as Lapras at the end of the gym, but otherwise it was a really simple easy gym for us to speed through. On Route 9 we encountered our second self-inflicted creature loss of the run, when a Kingla we encountered died to hail before I could capture it. However, as a consolation prize I went to the wild area post gym and encountered another Kingla, which was this time caught successfully and named Cookie after the sound the Pokemon makes in the 4Kids anime dub. If you've never heard it, it basically just makes the sound which always sounded like cookie to me. Racing ahead toward the 7th gym, an almost exclusively dark type gym, we put a lot of our hopes on DeVito, a slow fighting type who could take big hits if needed, and would deal double damage if they attacked second, which they almost always did. While we made it to the gym leader without issue, we did lose a number of members of our team in the final fight. The gym lead appears, near the end of the fight used Obstagoon, who knew the move counter, which doubles any damage taken and sends it back at the attacker. Basically, if we couldn't one hit kill Obstagoon, we were going to take huge damage as punishment. We almost lost Leah Moira to discovering that, leaving her on a mere 2 HP, but Ivan was not so lucky. Ivan used Iron Head, which came so unbelievably close to knocking out the Obstagoon, but fell just a tiny bit short, and resulted in Ivan being swept to their death very promptly. We survived the gym, but not without a casualty. In the wild area, we picked up a Sneasel, evolved Hatterum to Hatena, evolved Mr. Whippy to Vanillux, and prepared to head over for the final gym standing in our way. Thanks to having a fully evolved ice type Pokemon, and a series of Pokemon with other type advantages to pair my ice cream with, 
most of the 2 on 2 dragon type gym challenges went pretty smoothly. The only real issue we had was Duraladon, a dual steel dragon type who was immune to being wiped out easily by my ice type moves. I foolishly didn't swap Mr. Whippy out and they were demolished in a single blow, leaving DeVito to take revenge and wrestle the skyscraper sized dragon back down to the ground. Heading back to the wild area post gym, I made the decision to catch my final wild area Pokemon at random from the Lake of Outrage, a late game area full of powerful and rare level 60 Pokemon. My reasoning was that if I only got one more creature, it should be the best one possible. The problem is, the Garbodor we ran into overpowered my team, and while we did successfully capture our new tanky poison type, we lost Static, our only electric type, in the process. Garbodor was named Trash Goblin, because after they killed Static, that felt like the name they deserved. Heading to Route 10, which was our final chance to catch a Pokemon before the League itself, we ended up encountering a new Vanillish. After much deliberation about duplicate creatures, we were permitted to go for something else if we wanted because we'd already had one, we did decide to catch this second Vanillish and named them Whippy Junior. They were here to avenge the death of their father at the Dragon Gym, and with that, things were getting serious. We made it to Winden, the final town in the game, and braced ourselves for some tough fights ahead. There was only one town standing between me and victory. First up, we had to rematch both of our friendly rivals, Hop and Marnie. Marnie went down pretty easily, as did Hop, potentially setting me up for overconfidence. These first two fights in the championship had come and gone without a single fatality, and with only a handful of fights left in the game, victory felt tantalisingly within my grasp for the first time during the playthrough. We took down most of the Pokemon in Rose Tower with ease, using Nikitu to burn through the near-exclusively Steel-type Tower of Trainers. Oleana at the top of the tower proved more difficult, with her mix of elemental types causing us some trouble. Up against her Gigantamax Garbodor at the end of the fight, I foolishly miscalculated the strength of a Fire-type move from Nikitu, and stayed in the fight one turn too long, thinking I could take the Mountain of Trash out with a single attack. Garbodor held on with a slither of health and took Nikitu out in the process. At least I kept my earlier promise. Nikitu did get to see the League with her own eyes, she got to fight in those first two League battles, something the original Nikit had robbed from them. And with that, it was time! There were four gym leaders to rematch, one villain to defeat, one legendary to fight, and then the champion. We were down to six actual trainers left to defeat, Victory seemed tantalisingly close. I started to let myself believe that, in a Nuzlocke where I'd taken on every optional difficulty rule possible, I might actually see the glory of my day as the League Champion. My team was set, and I felt confident they were balanced in such a way they could handle the full League without any switching required. We had Beyblade the Bronzong, Trash Goblin the Garbodor, Lombro the Ludicolo, Whippy Jr. the Vanillux, Liamoira the Hippodon, and Captain Crunch the Dreadnought. It was the best spread of elemental types possible, we had our moves set up ready to go, and there were these creatures that they seemed like they could reliably pull us out of tough spots. This felt like the right team to go with. First up, we had our rematch with Bede, a former arsehole rival now turned fairy gym leader in training. We led with Beyblade, hoping our Steel-type moves could once again solo the Fairy Leader, but luck was not on our side. A few Pokemon deep, we switched into Captain Crunch, hoping that Crunch would be a good counter for the Fairy-Psychic-type combo Pokemon, and a safer choice than using our Poison-type Garbodor. Up against Gigantamax Hatterene, we managed to pull out a smooth enough win without any losses, but the match was far closer than I would have hoped, seeing as Seeing the type advantage I had on paper, I had several Pokemon that were almost entirely lost, and it started to dawn on me that we may not have been as prepared as we hoped. Next was the rematch with Nessa, made all the more complicated by Static's unfortunate, premature death catching Garbodor. We had Ludicolo, who was a grass type, but they were undoubtedly going to struggle against Pokemon like Pelipper, with their partial flying typing. Nessa's Galissapod proved to be a huge challenge, because 
if it ever drops below half health, it automatically switches itself out. This made it hard to hit with two consecutive strong attacks, but also caused us to multiple times end up placed into tight matchups where we were no longer prepared to handle. We ended up taking a really strong critical hit attack from Galissapod late in the match, with Lombro out and poised to fight the final creature that next turn, and we lost Lombro in a single attack. This put us in a really bad position because we no longer had any reliable and tested counter for water type Pokemon. We got through the rest of the fight without any additional fatalities, but the cracks in my team composition were starting to show. We no longer had our only Pokemon with built-in recovery, a Pokemon that had carried us through countless matches and things were getting worrying. Then it came time for our rematch with Alistair, the ghost type gym leader who had previously robbed us of our starter Pokemon. Little did I know at the time, but this fight was going to go very, very badly for me. I opened with Captain Crunch, whose dark type move Crunch I hoped would carry me through most of these ghost types. Things went okay at first, with Dusk Noir going down in a couple of attacks, but I vastly underestimated the potential harm done by Poltegeist, the Teapot Ghost. Turns out Poltegeist has Grass type moves, not just Ghost type moves, and Grass type moves are really, really, really effective against a Water Rock type Pokemon. Captain Crunch went down in a single attack, and it became clear how vulnerable our team was by having not leveled them more. Whippy Jr. took out the teapot pretty safely, but had to be swapped out when faced by the fire-type ghost Chandelure. I sent in Leah Moira, my only remaining Pokemon with decent dart-type moves, but my damage output just wasn't enough. I realistically needed to be one-hit killing Pokemon when I had type advantage, but needing to set off second attacks was causing me to take too much incremental damage over time to my only big damage dealers. I pulled Leah Moira out of the battle with only a single HP remaining, hoping she would be saved to fight another day, and swapped into Beyblade, who started hemorrhaging health to Cursula. I switched into Whippy Jr, hoping I could kill the ghost with sheer cold, a one-hit kill attack. I failed, losing Whippy Jr in the process. Gordon, who had barely been used since their capture, came out and finished off Cursula, which put us in what I thought was a decent position. We were up against a Gigantamax Gengar, but I reasoned they were just as weak to my ghost type attacks as I was to there, so I kept my ghost in, Dynamaxed them, ugh, oh, big mistake. Gengar was faster, and in a single attack my ghost pumpkin was dead, along with my ability to Dynamax Pokemon. I wish I had not wasted my Dynamax on Gordon, but that's a th the thing about hindsight. I... if I... If I'd left them undynamaxed, I could have used Shadow Sneak, a move that always goes first, and while that wouldn't have killed them and it wouldn't have done as much damage as a dynamaxed ghost move, it would have done some extra damage, and I think in hindsight that would have been enough to make the difference and to let me survive this gym. At this point I switched into Garbodor, who had a pretty decent psychic type move and full health. I managed to get off one psychic attack and it did pretty good damage before Gengar disabled that move, and locked me into battle, unable to switch out. I was trapped and unable to do much damage because my only remaining moves were poison-type moves, and things were looking bad. Slowly, I chipped away at Gengar, using poison-type moves that were super ineffective. I managed to get Gengar down to a tiny slither of red health, and with three Pokemon left in my party, I thought I might just be able to scrape a win together and rebuild my team from my box before the next fight, but things just didn't go that way. Garbodor wasn't fast enough to get an attack out before Gengar, so Garbodor died. We only had Beyblade and Leah Moira left, and I only needed to get one of them to do one attack or one little bit of damage for us to progress. Both of them are slow Pokemon, and... As I saw it, neither of them had a chance to get an attack out before being killed. It all seemed hopeless. I sent Beyblade out first, and that was entirely the wrong move. I completely forgot that sending out Leah Moira sets up a Sandstorm automatically as part of her special ability, which would have dealt enough damage to kill Gengar without needing to be fast enough to launch an attack. If I had sent out Leah Moira first, she would have died, but Gengar would have died before I sent out Beyblade, giving me the win. 
I foolishly sent them out the other way around, meaning that I died before the sandstorm damage could take out Gengar. My Nuzlocke challenge ended with Alistair, the same trainer who had taken my starter from me, returning to demolish my team and end my run. Feels kind of fitting, considering that they're uh, all about ghosts and death. Now, I recognise that I could have levelled up my Pokemon more before the League, or made slightly better choices about the Pokemon turn order I used, or even just been less rules harsh on myself, and I probably could have seen this Nuzlocke run through to the end of it. However, I'm glad I played it the way I did, losses and all. I found a brand new appreciation for several Pokemon species I never used in my normal playthroughs of the games. I felt my losses, I felt my victories, and I am proud of how far I made it. I was within three trainers of a complete run, which, while not yet a victory, did make me feel confident that next time I might be more lucky. I learned lessons, I came to better understand how the game is played, and I got to go on an adventure unlike any other I've had with the series. I don't know when I'll do another Nuzlocke run of a Pokemon game. Probably not for a while, as the stress levels they induce probably shaved a few years off my life, but I know I'll do another one eventually, and next time, I'm going all the way to the top.